Hello, my name is Jean-François. I am a professor at Université Laval, Québec, Canada. I even have the shirt to go with it. And today uh, we're going to be talking about leveraging omnidirectional images to learn how to estimate lighting from a single image. And in order to motivate the talk, I'm going to start by uh, using an example of one of the problems I've been looking at for the past few years now, and that is uh, of inserting virtual bunnies into photographs. And uh, if I want a nice looking result like this one, one of the key problems that uh, we've uh, stumbled upon is that of lighting estimation. So I want to be able to relight the virtual object, the virtual bunny here, with the correct lighting conditions. And what are the correct lighting conditions? Well, those are the ones from the scene itself. And of course, that single image has a limited field of view, and I don't have all the information necessary in order to recover that lighting. Indeed, the information that I really need is available in all of the surroundings of the image, namely in the 360 degrees uh, image that would have been taken at that location. So if I want to capture the light, what uh, I uh, actually would need to do is, uh, if I follow the literature, it comes dates back to 1998 with the Bevec, and he suggested to actually insert a metallic sphere in the scene and take multiple photos at different exposures of that ball. And what you get is then uh, you fuse them into a single high dynamic range image. And what you get by doing this is that at every point on the sphere, you have a surface normal, so it gives you a direction. And because you've shot in HDR, you also have the correct lighting intensity and color along, uh, that comes in at that direction. So um, that's the way to do it. And that's essentially how um, special effects in movies are shot nowadays. Unfortunately, um, having a chrome sphere in a picture is actually a pretty rare occur occurrence. Unless you're uh, walking around in Paris in the Parc de la Villette. Um, I was actually walking there last year and I stumbled upon this giant chrome sphere waiting for me to take a photo of it and actually use it as a, as a light source. Uh, but uh, of course that's that. Or also uh, you could be walking around around the Christmas time like I was doing last year with my daughters and uh, we found some nice looking uh, giant Christmas ornaments who happened to be reflecting the light uh, coming in from all directions towards the camera. So uh, that was nice. But aside from um, maybe a few other examples that I have in my photo library, but I think I'll just stop right here, um, they're pretty rare. So what we'd like is to be capturing the light. And if you look at the literature, then we either need one of two things, either inserting specific calibration objects in the scene or use a specific hardware like a 360 degree camera with high dynamic range enabled in order to shoot multiple exposures of all the incoming light at a point. So that's nice, but unfortunately, if we have an existing image, that is not practical and we cannot do that. So instead, what we're going to be talking about today are two techniques that will capture the light from an image, but doing so without any calibration object and from a conventional camera only. And then what I'm going to present today, uh, the key idea is that we're going to frame lighting estimation as a learning problem. And instead of using 360 panels to capture the light, we're going to actually leverage them for training a single image uh, lighting estimation network. All right, so uh, the talk today is going to be split into two parts. The first part, we'll talk about non-parametric lighting estimation, and that's some work that we've published uh, in 2017. And then in the second part, we'll talk about parametric lighting. And this is more recent work that we published last year at ICCV. All right, let's get started with the first part. So how do we train a neural network that will estimate lighting from a single image? And for this, we're going to actually be leveraging 360 degrees panos. So suppose I start with a panoramic a data set of panoramas. And for this, we can use uh, the well-known uh, Sun360 data set from Xiao et al from 2012. And uh, if we take a single one of those panels, this is actually, as we were mentioning, a 360 degrees view of, uh, of a scene. So from that, we can extract a small image, which will act as an input to our neural net. And then the output will simply be the panorama itself, which is an estimation of the lighting conditions of that scene, as we discussed before. And we simply put a CNN in the middle. That sounds great, right? Sounds like a, a cool strategy and hopefully it's going to work. But unfortunately, as soon as we start looking into the problem a little bit more, we realize that that, cannot, that just cannot work. 
Why? One of the reasons why is that it's the images um, in the Sun360 database and essentially the, y, the vast majority of all the panoramas we can find online are LDR, by that we mean low dynamic range. And what this means is that this, the pixels in the image do not properly capture the light. In fact, if I take a look at a, a zoomed in version of that panorama, the top of the table has a value of 111. And the bright light sources also have a value of 111 because they're both saturated. But of course, we all know that the bright light sources should be a lot brighter than the table. So that's a problem. So we cannot rely on this to just detect, to just predict essentially pixel colors. What we want is to predict the, the correct light intensity. So in order to do that, we're still going to want to work with our uh, LDR database. So we'll train a simple light detector. And for this, we'll uh, travel back in time a little bit and employ some uh, old school computer vision techniques like hog and color based features. And we'll manually label 400 panoramas and, uh, uh, you know, with a logistic regression classifier followed by a CRF refinement, we can get a pretty decent uh, light detector that, uh, that detects those light sources from indoor uh, LDR panoramas. All right, so now what we're going to do is that instead of learning to predict the panel itself, we're going to learn to predict two things, the panorama on one side and the actual detected light sources that we're going to treat as a light, as a binary light mask. All right, so we're almost ready to do it. But unfortunately, just before we could see some results of, that, of doing that, um, we noticed one thing that was actually super important, and that is that indoor lighting is spatially varying. And for this, I just want to take... Uh, this example that's maybe a little bit extreme, I think you might agree with me, you'll agree with me that it's a little bit extreme, but I think it shows the point pretty well. And the idea here is that we're going to take, let's say, this panorama, and suppose we're going to extract that little white box right in the middle, and that's going to become our input to the neural network. And the output, the desired output, would be the light mass computed from the entire panel. Because the crop, the white, the, the white uh, rectangle that we're extracting is not at the same location, so it's a location further away in the scene as opposed to the center of projection of our panorama, the light conditions at that location are not the same as the lighting conditions at the place where the panorama was shot. So let me just show this example. So if I'm gonna insert a virtual bunny in there, so right under the, the, the light, then it should be lit that way. But if we were to light it with the panorama, panorama lighting, which we assume is the ground truth, we would get this. So clearly the panorama lighting is not the correct lighting of the place where we're going to be putting the object. So that's a, that's a big problem. So essentially it invalidates our entire training scheme of, of, uh, of leveraging panoramas for training a lighting estimation network. So what we would like is to essentially be able to move inside the scene. But unfortunately, we only have a 360 panel. This is a spherical representation. We have no idea of the 3D. So what we could do is to uh, employ the, the method of, of, of Banterli et al. called NVDepth. Um, and the idea here is that uh, you label with some scribbling interface uh, the walls, the, the ceiling, and the floor in order to get a rough 3D model of the environment. And there you can actually use it to, uh, to uh, have spatially varying lighting. So you could use this to deform and warp the, the panel in order to adjust the lighting conditions for the insertion, the, the point where you want to, uh, to cut, a, cut an image. But unfortunately, that takes kind of a lot of work and, and we have 40,000 panels in the Sun360 data set, so we don't want to do this manually. So we came up with this automatic solution, which is a simple spherical warp. So everything stays in spherical coordinates. You only need to essentially stretch the sphere back as is shown on the, on the screen. And this you know, approximates a geometrically coherent uh, warp. If I go back to the uh, example we were using before, as I move forward, you can see the bunny relit on the right, and uh, you know it becomes uh, lit sort of uh, from the top, and then as the light moves to the back, it becomes backlit as it was before. And if we compare what we had before, so this is the real lighting on the left, the panoram panorama lighting on the right, and if I insert the warped light, the warped panorama lighting, this is what I get. All right, so finally we can have what we need. We have a panel, we extract a crop, we warp the panel according to that crop, and that gives us our ground truth lighting. Phew. Uh, and just as a side note, I just wanted to point out that there's some recent work, notably by uh, Fernandez Labrador last year, 
um, to, that extract uh, rough 3D uh, 3D models from panos. So that would have been uh, it would be interesting to explore how we can use this in our context. All right, now we're ready to train a neural network. So I'm just going to skip over the architecture because I think these are kind of this is nothing new. So we have just a, a single encoder, two decoders that are going to decode the light mask and the RGB panel. I just want to show you a couple of qualitative results because I think those show interestingly that uh, the network is able to pick up on the cues, the lighting cues that are present in the image. So if we have the input image on the left, this would be the predicted light probability overlaid on top of the, panor the panorama where the image was taken from. And I just want to point out that the network never actually had access to that panorama. We only use this for uh, visualization. And um, we also display the light probability, which essentially, of course, the network doesn't predict a binary value perfectly. So it ranges between a zero and one, one being red and, and zero being dark blue. But of course, we threshold in order to, uh, to see the original uh, panel behind. So you can see that it actually is able to reason about the shading in the image and detect the correct location of the light source. This is another example where there actually are two light sources if you uh, look at it carefully and it's also able to detect that there's a window on the left uh, and maybe a somewhat of a brighter, maybe more concentrated light source on the right. And finally, here's an interesting example where we could see a bright light source uh, visible in the image. Yet there's another part of the image over here that should be lit by another light source. Clearly, it's not lit by this one. And uh, the network is also able to adapt to this and it detects the second light source uh, quite well. All right, so this is for this first part. We are able to detect, to predict uh, light sources from a single indoor image. We didn't really talk about the RGB panorama, but you know, it's able to get a, a rough, really pretty, uh, pretty diffuse and pretty, uh, pretty smooth uh, estimate of the, of the average color of the scene. But uh, this is pretty good at the predicting the lighting, the light positions, but uh, we haven't talked about their intensities so far because we've been dealing with LDR, that is low dynamic range panels exclusively, right? So how we're going to estimate how bright the light sources are. That's actually a pretty important aspect that we've, uh, we've glossed over so far. So unfortunately, LDR is not going to cut it. So we're going to fine tune our network on high dynamic range data in the second step. And where do we get high dynamic range 360 degree panoramas. Well, there was there weren't any at the time we were working on this, so we just went out and started capturing them. A very uh, large, so 2400 high dynamic range, 360 degree panoramas that we've captured in lots of different locations. And of course, we came up with this nice little montage that zooms out into uh, the picture of uh, Université Laval's campus. And that is what happened when graduate students have too much time on their hands. So um, sk skipping over. So this is the data. We, it's available for, um, uh, for you for research. So just uh, you know, send me an email and I'd be happy to share it with you guys. And once we fine tune our network on the HDR, this allows us to get you know, not only uh, the RGB panorama, but if I show the log, the light intensity in log space on the right hand side, we can actually get the brightness of the light sources, which is exactly what we wanted. Here's another example. But perhaps a, a more telling example is what happens when we insert virtual objects in the photograph using our technique. So from this single image, we estimate the lighting and then use it to relight virtual objects, such as this uh, stack of books or this uh, toy bicycle. All right, so um, the question we are asking at the end of that project was, well, okay, so we're regressing this whole environment map, this whole latitude, uh, 360 degree panorama uh, that contains uh, 32,000 pixels, essentially. So do we need all of these pixels, right? So what is really, really important for lighting estimation? If I give you this panel, for example, do, are all the pixels equally important for lighting an object? Clearly, the answer is no, right? There's a few pixels that are a lot more important than others. What are those pixels? The, the ones that belong, that correspond to the light sources, of course, right? So in the second part of the talk, and that one's going to be a little bit quicker, we're going to talk about parametric lighting estimation. Um, and in this one, we're going to employ a very, very similar uh, strategy of using 360 degree panoramas for training. But in this case, instead of regressing the entire panorama, we're first going to do a few pre-processing steps. So from the original 360 panel, we're going to detect the light sources. And in this case, we'll rely exclu exclusively 
on HDR data, so it's a lot easier to detect. So essentially, just detect the bright stuff and region grow until you hit a particular threshold. And uh, we end up with these detected light sources. And if I were to just render uh, two different, uh, the same scene, I mean, with the two different panoramas, then on the left hand side, you see the scene rendered with the full pano. And on the right hand side, the scene rendered with only the pixels corresponding to the light sources turned on, everything else is black. And you can see, well, everything else corresponds, sorry, to the average, the mean color of, uh, of the rest of the scene. So you can see that in both cases, they look extremely similar and we haven't really lost a lot of information. All right, so our goal is going to be to learn parametric light sources. So from our detected light sources, we'll fit a very simple model corresponding of a few parameters the direction, the size, the color uh, for each light source, and then the ambient turn. And on top of that, we'll also add the depth, which uh, the depth will uh, will get by uh, using the power of undergrads, uh, which uh, helped us labeling 1500 high dynamic range uh, panels from our data set. And when we label them using the NV depth uh, system I mentioned earlier, uh, that one allows you to get the depth. So we're gonna actually position the light sources in 3D with respect to the camera, uh, using that approach. And then we can train a neural network that uh, actually has a pretty straightforward architecture of, uh, of a dense net encoder followed by, by a, a latent vector. And then you end up with a FC layer that immediately regresses each one of those parameters for the light sources. And then very, very briefly, we have a two-stage training process where in the step one, we have a loss on the environment map projection. So we're going to take the virtual, the parametric light sources, project them onto an environment map using spherical Gaussians and have a loss on that. And what that allows us to do is that it allows us to avoid the assignment problem of having to know which estimated light source corresponds to which ground truth light source. And in step two, we'll have a, uh, a estimation of the depth and refinement of all the other parameters. And then we'll have a loss on the 3D parameters themselves by fixing the light position. All right, and just skipping ahead to some results, I uh, welcome you to take a look at the paper if you wanna know more details. So uh, on stock photos taken off the web where we have absolutely no control over anything, aside, uh, we're just given the pixels. These are a few results where you can see some pretty pronounced shadows that correspond, that, that match well the position of the light sources. Here's another example where we insert a couch. And what's interesting here is that uh, this parametric lighting representation gives us spatially varying lighting results for free. So from our previous work, the non-parametric, we had a single global estimation for the entire scene and irrespective of where you place the object in the scene, you always get the same relative lighting position. In our case, because we have floating light sources that we're estimating, for example, it's estimating that there's a light source coming from this direction. So depending on where you put the object, the virtual object with respect to that light source, you get different uh, orientations of shadows. For example, this cushion here has the shadow pointing this direction. And if you take a look at the bottom of the chair, the shadows are pointing in the other direction. So that's kind of a nice side effect. And uh, to show this off, we're just uh, taking this armadillo and we're gonna move it around along the scene and just pay attention to its shadows on the floor. They're actually moving according to its position in a realistic manner. And of course, because we have param parameters, we could easily um, ask a user, for example, to, uh, to tweak them. So it's a, another benefit is that the output is something that a human can, can understand and interpret. So after loading a scene, um, the neural network essentially um, puts the sliders at the right place and then uh, a user could essentially uh, move them around and, and, and edit the, the relighting result in real time. All right, so uh, that uh, almost concludes the talk. Uh, before I uh, let you go, I just wanted to uh, sort of briefly review the overall training strategy, which I think is quite interesting and, and pretty relevant for uh, the participants of this workshop in particular, where we're gonna use 360 degrees panoramas for training, where we start for, from a panel, we're gonna extract a regular image, a limited field of view image, and uh, from the panel, we'll get some ground truth, right? So, so far we've gotten indoor lighting, but uh, we could get other things. And then in the middle, we just plug a, a, deep, a deep network and hope uh, that, uh, that uh, we're able to learn the mapping from the image to the parameters we were looking for. 
And over the past couple of years, we looked, we've looked at a few uh, different uh, scenarios that we could apply this for. So we've discussed indoor lighting during the talk today, but we've also looked at uh, outdoor lighting, which has, which is a little bit different in the sense that it has a, a single, well, two light sources, the sun and the sky, where, but the sun has this particular feature that it's extremely bright. It's a lot brighter than anything else we know. So there are some uh, specific models that, uh, that need to be, uh, that need to take, uh, that uh, got to take care of this. And then finally, we've also explored uh, the camera parameters, for example, uh, field of view, uh, pitch and, uh, and roll uh, that we can extract uh, from a panorama in order to, uh, to uh, train a neural net that can estimate this from a single image. All right, so on this note, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, before that, I'll thank uh, my team. So these are all my students. Uh, most of the work that I presented today was Marc-André, the one straight smack in the middle, Marc-André's work. Um, I also would like to thank my industrial partners as well as academic partners and funding agencies. And on that note, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. And I would love to take your questions at the live Q&A later today. Thanks.